we live in a world where we create megatons and megatons of data every second and we don't know where it's going and we actually don't care. We only care about it when it breaks down, mm -hmm. when something goes wrong. And then everybody is like, oh my God, I d uh, 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 iCloud can be hacked. So, oh my God, I didn't know that. And you're like, really, if your password is called password123, you shouldn't be surprised. <laughs> Hi Chris. Hello. How are you? I'm good. Uh, it's very early in the morning, just yeah. before the conference. Yeah. Uh, I just figured out the shower heads and everything, how that worked out, and we talked about the UX of showers already. Yeah. So. I mean. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's always fascinating how we're we're knowing how to program things, but when it comes to different levers and buttons, we're always like, what the hell is going on? Here? It's trickier than we than we thought it would be, um, mm -hmm. but yeah, works out in the end. Yeah, it's also it's quite a good idiom for software development because a lot of these things get extended. They were just normal going a tap yeah. going into the bath, and then the shower head came extra, and then the extra shower head came on, yeah. and then it became uh, the same way we had only cold water and then hot water. That's why in England we always have two taps because yeah. they're different water pipes. That one of them is heated and the other one isn't, which is then you burn your hand, and then you then you heal it again, and then you burn it. And then you <laughs> <laughs> again I'm just like installing this library and using it burning yourself with it uninstalling it using the next library kind of thing uh, yeah but that, I use that metaphor for for uh, why uh, why TDD makes sense because when you are doing TDD when you write the test yeah. then you are actually syncing with the head of the user and not with the head of the implementer yeah and and that happens uh, with the, uh, the taps right when when you are syncing with the head of the of the the mechanic that uh, creates this, he says, "Okay, I have a, a pipe for for hot water and a pipe for cold water. I just want uh, to be able to close each of them, right?" Yeah, and also a preset thing. Like, I mean, does it start from the hot? Does it start from the cold? Yeah. Like that, some people want to start from the hot, other people want to get into the hot. So you're always like yeah. wondering. And then there is always the granularity as well. Like you're like, okay, I just do a one little notch, and out of a sudden I'm burned. Yeah, yeah. And uh, again, it's like, okay, I'm using this extra, uh, this extra piece of software, or I'm using this extra build script that makes my life so much easier. And out of a sudden, you made it so much more complex for anybody to take that project off from you and maintain it because mm -hmm. you actually assume them to work like you. It's a great example. TDD is like the people who write the code should probably not the people writing the, the, the tests. I'm no, I'm actually not uh, convinced about that. I, I, I really think that just by um, making you write the test first is enough to, to get you in the mindset that this is going to be used by someone. But to have a proper, uh, to have a proper, uh, uh, I mean, we would, we're lazy as developers. We would never write the tests that break our things. Whereas mm -hmm. like a good QA person is there to actually challenge you and to come up with the solutions or come up with the mm -hmm. edge cases that mm -hmm. you never thought of. It's like, it's the old joke where it's like a QA engineer goes into a bar, orders a beer, orders five beer, orders minus, minus 10 beers, orders a lizard. Because <laughs> this is, what, this is what, what QA people should do. Like the, yeah. things should uh, should be, be tested for breakage, not only for like, okay, all my tests are working great I've done TDD mm -hmm. where it's like eh, you know that's not the way to to do these kind of mm -hmm. things the same way when uh, uh, we talk about like uh, I mean we're both going to talk about uh, deep learning and artificial intelligence at this mm -hmm. event it's like a lot of people just take a, a minor set of data and then are very excited how fast their model learns and because the, because the data coming in is already so clean that yeah. you don't need to think about it and you don't need to go through many iterations to get good results and yeah. that doesn't mm -hmm. help anybody in the long run yeah that's true and uh, and what is your talk going to be about i'm talking about how we uh, uh, how we have all these uh, different apis uh, available to us that are deep learning apis and uh, uh, not only get the outcome of them but also allow our own data to go in them and do the training with a graphical interface these kind of things mm -hmm. so instead of people thinking that uh, machine learning has to be something that you have to learn from scratch uh, a lot of the information that we have is available as very simple to use APIs and we should mm. use them to build 
more human clever interfaces you know yeah. allow humans to do human things to use our things and not mm. know the right keywords to do a search for example a search mm. should allow for uh, natural language processing to mm. allow you to write a full sentence in there mm -hmm. and the search should do the clever things in the background using an api like that mm. so my main point about this is that right now machine learning is the big thing and everybody talks about like how only a few companies have the power over it we should bring it back to the normal thing, uh, to the normal interfaces that people use day to day. Okay. Our our, our day to day usage interfaces are not intelligent at the moment, and uh, most of the time it's because people think it's too hard to do it, and it's not. It's actually REST APIs getting you giving you the extra information that you need, and uh, we should embellish our interfaces that way rather than having to. Uh, people having to use machines or use a certain closed environment just to get that functionality. Case mm -hmm. in point, everybody talks about uh, uh, Siri and Cortana and, uh, and chatbots mm -hmm. and these are great things, but they should not be the only ones that allow for natural language processing. Mm -hmm. These are the hardcore interfaces that actually get, get kind of boring after a while. I know everybody used Siri when it came out, but most of the time I see people using Siri, it says like set an alarm for 10 minutes. Yeah. <laughs> this is what they're using it for. That, that's, and, that's exactly what I do. <laughs> and my my main point about it is that the babies are in the bathwater with everything that we're doing right now because uh, we, for 10, 12 years, we have these phones that spied on us, that did recordings of us, that we, every photo that we uploaded somewhere on the cloud got analyzed, got uh, went through a deep learning algorithm and something got done with it. But mm. we don't have access to that information. Mm. Now for us as developers, it should be the, the right time to demand access to that information. Mm. So not only a few people making up a story about your about you from your data, but people getting insight of what data was gathered and what kind of information comes out of it. People mm -hmm. complain that ads are not working because they're getting ads shown that don't work for them. Mm -hmm. So getting insight of what an ad network thinks that I am would mm -hmm. help with that. You know, I mean, mm -hmm. I don't mind I don't mind ads as long as they don't spy on me and as long as they don't actually uh, download or uh, uh, mine Bitcoin on my machine. Uh, I'm happy to buy things if they're actually relevant to me, but if mm -hmm. ads only disrupt what we're doing, then our whole business model of the web is broken. We gotta we gotta do better than that. Yeah, and I even people agree. even mm -hmm. people who do it amazingly well. Amazon is just incredible in that in their machine learning, and I just bought a suitcase on Amazon, and it's got a, a, a lifetime guarantee. Yeah, yeah. So okay, what does Amazon do? It shows me ads for more suitcases. <laughs> That makes no sense. Like it has a lifetime guarantee. If the thing breaks, I get it replaced. I don't need yeah. another suitcase. Mm -hmm. I'm happy with the one that I have. But offer me things uh, that add to my suitcase or offer me things that make it easier to use my suitcase, but not another suitcase. Our mm -hmm. ads should be cleverer than that. We're spying on people all the time with all the software that people are doing, but we're not mm -hmm. using the information for the, uh, for the benefit of the end user. We're using it basically to show more random stuff that pays more. It's it's an interesting one to say though, because like this is the most obvious thing, but so many times we get too excited about technical innovation and we want to do new cool feed, new, new cool stuff rather than understanding what people really want, mm -hmm. what people really come for. And mm -hmm. uh, uh, that's where again UX and user research comes in, I think. And mm -hmm. a lot of times it needs to be. I love, for example, that we are having the, the um, emotion recognition in video and audio and mm -hmm. images. So when you do, for example, a, a, a test of a website, you have a camera on like this one right now. And instead, uh, in, uh, in addition to what the interviewer asks people what they think of it, we also have the facial expressions, and we know how many times they just tried to please the interviewer or uh, they actually <laughs> were confused about an interface. Okay. So doing uh, doing emotion recognition in, you, uh, in user testing while they're actually working with your system is a very, very powerful tool to get this extra mm. information and it's very honest information as well. Because yeah. it's, it's when we as humans try to lie or try to, to say like, I know this and our body language basically tells, no, you don't. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Then we, we know it's like, it's not that we, 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 uh, we discover people lying but it actually means our interfaces should be better because they're confusing people they just don't want to admit it yeah I actually had an interesting discussion uh, a few weeks back with uh, one of the uh, cab drivers in Budapest and we have this uh, app called Taxify it's like uh, Uber yeah, just, or, or just for tax, taxes right my taxi yeah, yeah. yeah. and and, uh, and the thing is that he was uh, when I told him that I was uh, 
teaching a workshop about, about continuous deployment and I taught him what continuous deployment was, he just lost his mind because he said, oh, that's the thing that I hate the most. They update everything and everything changes all the time and I, I can't figure out what's, what's where because uh, they put it to some other place that I'm not used to. So he was really upset about the whole concept of, of, of continuous deployment. And he also said that, okay, I would be really happy uh, about uh, people th fixing stuff but no one ever asked me if I liked it. Yes. And and that's 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 uh, actually true in some cases. But the thing is that if you ask people if they like things, they just say yes most of the time because they want to be polite. And or, and that's that's or, actually a real real problem that you you actually have to uh, figure out what people really think about things and even if you just figure out what makes more money even if it's not super convenient for the user well, it's like the hoarding mentality as well like oh yeah do you want this new feature sure i can use more features yeah if the feature makes sense or not doesn't matter at the beginning we don't, just don't use it later on yeah like when when twitter came out it was a great messaging platform just for 140 characters and out of a sudden it, uh, it became a video platform and an image platform and an audio platform and like you can you know have groups and all kind of stuff and everything always becomes like we have to keep innovating and putting new features into our system and then these systems become too complex and the next one comes to take over and say like mm. we're much more lightweight than the other one because we don't have all these features until next month when we get these features again <laughs> and that's again that's where that's where machine learning can come in quite nicely because it can do a lot of these things in the background for you yeah. and for mm. example uh, slack is a great example where the slack bots analyze what's going on in your text and then give you uh, buttons and functionality and shortcuts uh, depending mm -hmm. on what you've been writing rather than just like here's mm -hmm. a new feature do you like it maybe do an a b test you don't need to do it because you give the functionality according to what the user did with your interface yeah mm -hmm. and that's a very clever way of doing it i think um yeah people people like to say yes to a lot of things because they don't want to be seen to be falling behind as well yeah, and I think the biggest problem, and when, when he said he hates being things being up to date all the time, like in terms of security, we have to be up to date all the time. Yeah, mm -hmm. and uh, I hate when uh, when a certain company or other companies keeps talking about that something just works magically. I think it's dangerous the way we've uh, separated ourselves from our computers and from the things that we're using. We're not even expecting to be able to uh, repair them anymore or know what's going on in them. Yeah, that's and something that we actually discussed uh, yeah, last night over a beer. Yeah. That whenever you something breaks in your laptop or, or your phone, you just end up being uh, with a replacement eventually yeah. because they don't even try fixing it anymore. Well, even worse, people don't question things. I mean, if, if I said that in a talk before, if 10 years ago I would have come to you and said like, hey, can I put a microphone in your house that records everything that's going on? You'd be saying no. And then I would say like, yeah, what if it tells you the weather? Okay, cool, then put the microphone in my house. Like yeah. we, 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 we put these cameras and recording devices and we carry these mobile phones with us that record everything we do, but we don't even question where the data goes and we have no insight into mm -hmm. it yeah. for, this, uh, uh, for the sake of having convenience. And uh, um, I'm, yeah, I mean, I have no Alexa at home. I'm using, I'm hardly using the voice recognition on that thing because I, if I want to know the weather, it's not that hard to type in weather.com, mm -hmm. you know, but I'm old school. So probably people who are growing up with these machines right now just expect to be computers to be everywhere and you just talk to them and you get the information back. Mm -hmm. It's like Star Trek used to be in 1993 when we watched it on television. We have this now and we're still not happy. It always cracks me up when people go like, oh, I don't mind. I mean, I've got nothing to hide. And you, if you've got nothing to hide, the government should be getting all the information from you. And I'm like, well, that would work if they, if they, were, uh, if they were not inept about it. You know, yeah. if uh, mm -hmm. I'm worried about, uh, about bits of my information being put together in the wrong way and then making up a horrible story that I have to defend myself against. Yeah. That's what I'm worried about. I'm not mm -hmm. worried about people having all the information and knowing what to do with it. But if, uh, if you look at the track record of, uh, uh, of governments losing information and governments getting falling for false news, uh, fake news accounts as well. Yeah. They're also human, you know, like there's like, I'm, I'm, I don't trust anybody with all my information except mm -hmm. for myself. Yeah, but that... And even myself, I don't trust. 
Yeah, but that comes down to the fact that right now we are highly connected, right? So uh, it's not like a few dozen people know about knowing about your stuff anymore. It's about the whole world knowing about yeah. your stuff. And then when you when you have the whole world, it get it gets really difficult to go after the people who, who are hurting you, right? It was interesting when Neal when I talked to him about security at NDC. Uh, it's like his whole uh, asset idea, and I'm agreeing with it. Is like. We have to teach people not to give away privacy for free. Mm -hmm. We actually, the, the, the out of the box uh, uh, interaction of people is like, I put everything on the web and people do something with it. I'm totally mm -hmm. okay if my phone tracks my location all the time, unless somebody starts to stalk me and wants to kill me, then out of a sudden it becomes less useful that my phone knows where mm -hmm. I am all the time. Yeah. So the, uh, uh, the, the preset of people uh, uh, giving away information without thinking about it is something we need to fight. We need to have to, uh, we need to make people aware that it, their information is worth a lot of money and also worth a lot of uh, uh, danger for them. So they need to actually understand that it makes no sense to upload your photos with your GPS data intact, for example. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So there's uh, there's a big problem that no matter what we do in security, people are happily giving things away. You don't even mm -hmm. have to crack or uh, uh, <coughs> do, do social engineering nowadays. People do it for free anyways, as long as you <laughs> say, hey, our app is free if you give us all the data. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but that's actually really hard because uh, even if you try to be responsible yourself and, yeah. and tell the user, hey, I'm going to use your data. This is the data I'm going to take from you, and and you have to be conscious about that. Uh, either of two things going to happen. One, you scare away your users because yeah. they're not used to being informed about that, right? And then suddenly it becomes scary, or or they become aware of this for your application, but not for your competitors who might actually be using that data in a less uh, responsible way. Yeah, definitely. I mean, when I worked for Mozilla, there was always the problem. Firefox always tried to be very, very adamant about like, we don't take your information, we do this, you have to opt in for everything that's going on. Mm -hmm. And people didn't like it because they don't like opting in. They just, why don't you let me opt out? And I think opt out is such a cop out in terms of safety, in terms of uh, not being sued. Okay. Like companies telling me like, well, yeah, we record everything, but there is a menu where you can untick the things. Nobody yeah. finds this. Nobody reads terms and conditions. So it's, yeah. it's always like, oh, they could have turned it off. And you're like, well, no, you didn't make it obvious to them that that's even being recorded. But mm -hmm. if you tell people what you record, then they get freaked out by your and use the one that seems to be easier. Yeah. So it's a real, uh, it's a real issue that we, we live in a world where we create megatons and megatons of data every second and we don't know where it's going and we actually don't care we only care about it when it breaks down mm -hmm. when something goes wrong and then everybody is like oh my god i uh, 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 icloud can be hacked so oh my god i didn't know that and you're like really if your password is called password 123 you shouldn't be surprised <laughs> you know it's, uh, I, I mean it's, it's it's actually for passwords it's even simple because you just have to uh, use a service like LastPass, right? And yeah, well, well, I mean, I, I'm using the, the Intel one at the moment and I'm still worried about this because, uh, I mean, all these, like, uh, well, I mean, if they don't store my data, then fine. But the ones mm -hmm. that store your data, all you have to do is hack that system and you got yeah. access to everything. That's true. It's a, That's it's a single true. point of failure kind of opportunity. We have to get rid of passwords period i mean we have biometric information we have systems like this phone knows who i am mm. why do i have to put another password and log in and username for your service in there as well yeah 90, mm. 99 percent of the time it's just because you want to keep the tracking and you want a database of emails that you can sell to clients <laughs> it's not a matter of like oh we keep your extra security by putting another login in there there is ways from every operating system to get the identity of the user or get a verified token that this is this user. Yeah. But everybody puts their own interfaces in it and that teaches people a lot of bad practices. Mm -hmm. I love these like, oh, your password isn't strong enough, but it doesn't tell me what the rules are. Yeah, that, that, <laughs> that can be really annoying. <laughs> like, just don't tell me like, this is the reload like, uh, uh, and especially when you have these, uh, when every browser asks you if you want to save your uh, your login, and it, it, it does it on the page where you entered your password wrong. 
Mm -hmm. Like, oh, you just entered the wrong password. Do you want to save this? And you're like, no, it's the wrong password. Don't ask me to save that. Only <laughs> ask me <laughs> to save the after there was a successful login. Yeah. And we talked about this the other day on Twitter. Like, how do you do this? We could do it with a 200 OK uh, HTTP header and only then trigger the, the browser saving thing. Mm. Uh, but it's, it's, it's interesting how these simple interfaces can really be in your way because once you save the wrong login, it, it auto fills it for you all the time as well. Yeah. There's, uh, there's, uh, it's, it's fascinating how technology is, be, is in our life as a ubiquitous thing, but we don't take ownership over it anymore. We don't want to understand it. We just hope it's there. And it, it pains me every time I talk to people who are not working in IT and they look at us as, as gods. They're mm -hmm. like, oh my God, you know this, you know how computers work. That's amazing. And I'm like, <laughs> this is 2017. We had computers for 50 years. Like, why is this still such a thing? Why do, why are people are still afraid of technology? Why are they still uh, uh, thinking of some, this something as that I'm too stupid for that. I don't want to understand it. I think we failed in educating people on basic understanding what machines and computers do. Yeah, but uh, even even if you think about deep learning, uh, if if I talk when I talk to developers about deep, deep learning, and when I tell them that okay, I've been playing around with deep learning, I, I've been doing this for a year, I can actually build like uh, basic stuff and not so basic stuff. Uh, and when I tell that to even programmers, they're like, "Oh, you're a god," because. Developers don't have experience with, with, with deep learning and, and what you don't understand, you fear. It's because, a new, it's and a and, and, and that's, that's natural to fear something that you don't understand. Right? It's also a new buzzword. I mean, a lot of companies make like deep learning or machine learning this like magical thing like, oh God, we're a startup in the Silicon Valley. We do deep learning. Please give us VC money. We don't tell you what yeah. we're doing, but basically this is the cool new thing to do, much like we do microservices was before, or yeah. we do as, as a, a service, software as a service. We do like PAS, we use cloud. Yeah. Like uh, we, we always do this like, and then the, the press runs with it. They're like, oh my God, look what, what IBM Watson can do. It can predict cancer before you get it. Uh, yeah, and, and <laughs> actually, when why we are at IBM Watson, I am really annoyed by the, by the way uh, IBM goes around with this because they like to paint this picture that IBM Watson is like a single really strong AI uh, piece of software but in reality it's just a set of simple uh, deep learning models and not, not even all of them are deep learning they are just different uh, machine learning models as a suite but it's not not like something that, that works uh, out of the box and not like something that understands the problems that you have. Yeah, I mean, but not, none of them do. And if they do, they're gonna, make, they're gonna have horrible results because they're gonna cut corners trying to understand things. So, <laughs> but this is how marketing works. I mean, you can't fault IBM. I think a lot of the hype about IBM, especially after it's been on Jeopardy, Mm. Uh, was also not their making. That's the same thing when we in Microsoft do something and the press uh, praises us o o over the, the over the moon about what we're doing, and we're sitting like, no, that that we don't do that at all. This is not. I mean, you've probably been in project management meetings where your project manager promised the client everything yeah. when you were sitting next to it, and you're like, we don't do that. I don't even know what that is. No, no, we don't do anti gravity belts in PHP. <laughs> you know, but uh, 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 I think. They were the first ones to go big on the uh, on the uh, marketing front about it, and that's why a lot of people think like Watson is this like all thinking computer or robot thing out there that makes everything automatically. And Google does the same with their Go stuff now. The, the DeepMind now having a new Go algorithm this morning mm. that actually beat the other one ten times uh, already. And mm. I find these uh, very intelligent, very uh, uh, interesting research things. But a lot of times they're overkill in what they want to do and they're also kind of scary. I like the Facebook one where they had the two uh, robots starting to talk to each other in their own language that humans couldn't understand anymore. Yeah, and then, then when you actually look into the article, it turns out that it's, it's nothing scary. It's just no. the way it was designed and it's the reason they stopped it, it wasn't because it was scary. The, the reason they stopped it, it was because it didn't work well. Yeah. So, so actually, uh, I think one of the... So here is what I give fault to IBM is calling their suite Watson yeah. because they personified it. 
Yeah. And that that is a huge mistake, I think. Well, because uh, Siri, Cortana, that. <laughs> yeah, but the, but they were, they were the ones who started this trend. <laughs> and and here's the thing: uh, even calling deep learning uh, an artificial intelligence is, I think misleading at some level well artificial intelligence is the old was like 80 year old umbrella yeah, but, but, term but for in everything the, in, the, in the 60s artificial intelligence was just a computer it, <laughs> it, it wasn't that like like today it's it, it, when they talked about artificial intelligence it wasn't even a machine learning and then yeah. in the 70s it, it becomes becomes like a, a surrogate, surrogate term for machine learning and then in the 2000s it becomes a surrogate term for deep learning and every time we do that uh, people start being afraid that oh look, my god the singularity is coming and yes the singularity is coming it will come at some point but what I feel where it's misleading is that people uh, seem to think that deep learning is, is like uh, like the ultimate solution we just have to wait a bit until it gets better but in reality deep learning is all about giving a model to to uh, a system and then that system can figure out how to use that model to solve a problem but it doesn't it isn't able to uh, create a model of the real world by itself it does and repetition and it does analysis but yeah. it doesn't do uh, innovation and it doesn't do uh, like uh, uh, creativity mm -hmm. uh, I'm, I'm having this in my talk where i talk about uh, we just uh, play a lot of uh, um, trivial pursuit Mm -hmm. And a lot of these questions, I still have no idea what these questions mean, but I learned the answers by heart. And this is what computers do as well. Yeah. They don't mm -hmm. do the, they don't do the, like, I remember this by comparing it with something else because yeah, then they it don't makes do more sense to me. I mean, metaphors is something that never works with, with, yeah. with AIs, right? I mean, with deep learning uh, stuff. So I think there is a, is a vital piece missing for the singularity. I do think that deep learning will have uh, uh, role in creating the singularity but if you ask me if the singularity is is around the corner I don't think so not yet you know, and I also think that we, we don't understand that deep learning is just yet another tool to make our life easier mm -hmm. it's really good at spotting uh, uh, mistakes in repetitive tasks where humans are terrible I mean yeah. we talk about mm -hmm. automation and uh, 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 like machines that create things like drilling machines and stuff uh, monitoring themselves this is a good thing humans should not do the same job over and over and over again because as yeah. soon as we do it we get bored and when we get bored we make mistakes and when we make mistakes in a factory people die yeah that's absolutely if, true if robots get uh, break because they actually get tired of like or they have like a problem in their programming fine but if humans get get uh, die because they they just had to uh, had to do boring repetitive tasks this is what computers are better at yeah we we, done, we said about yesterday as well when we talked about automation it's like it's gonna kill a lot of jobs and a lot of these jobs are due to killing they're they're ready to be gone and they should be gone. Yeah, I mean, humans should do anything, those. Anything that is repetitive should be gone. Yeah. But the problem is that uh, is everyone uh, as a person able to uh, work in a in an industry that requires creativity? So my my main problem is that a lot of these folks who are working in repetitive jobs they don't want to learn how to do creative stuff because they are already rooted in in, the, in their old ways and they want their old jobs back let's face it though like those people have been told their whole life that they're too stupid to do anything else that's true yeah so uh if we had a universal income if you didn't have to work to live mm -hmm. and i'm 100 percent sure that a lot of these people would find creativity in themselves that they never thought of before mm -hmm. because they would feel uh, secure in their thinking that they actually have time to uh, to find out something new about themselves. My father and my brother have the same DNA as me. One of them is a fireman, the other one was a coal miner and then a factory worker. Mm. My brother keeps saying to me when I show him the computer stuff that I'm doing that he's too stupid for that and he will never understand it because his whole life he's been told this is the case. Mm. So if if he didn't have to do the job just to survive Mm -hmm. He probably would find a uh, uh, potential of creativity in himself that we mm -hmm. hadn't thought of. And this is where the new jobs that we need to create by 2020 will come.
from that mm. by giving people the freedom to innovate and giving people the freedom to think about themselves as something mm. more than just somebody who does a, a stupid task that a computer can do better. Yeah. And, but and, that means that we as the people who employ other people and governments have to stop being greedy. The money we yeah, can we save... Yeah, we have to stop being greedy and we have to understand that the capitalist model is, is due to break down yeah. because of the new technologies. Well, not and even that. I mean, one percent of the one uh, percent of the of the of the of the money is no ninety percent of the money is in one percent of the population. Yeah, that's, that that's, already shows that's a broken system. <laughs> yeah, and, and and part of the reason that happens is because we have all this uh, technology that enables you to just concentrate all the wealth in one point by just making things uh, more effective uh, at large scale, right? So when, yeah. whenever someone becomes a tiny, a tiny bit bigger fish than everyone else, then they have this uh, economy of scale uh, that is beyond imagination. This is, this is unprecedented in, in history to have that kind of uh, economy of scale that we have today. Well, also the, especially with technology. The necessity isn't there. The amount of people that have more money than they would ever need in their life. It's like, I mean, the Markov uh, 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 pyramid has been fulfilled. You don't need mm. more. You can start sharing. You can start giving things away. And I mean, I do it not with money because I'm not rich, but I do it with everything I do. Everything I do is open source. Everything I write is Creative Commons. People can mm -hmm. do whatever they want with it and take it away and run with it and mm -hmm. learn from it. And I do it because of selfish reasons. Because if I get hit by a bus tomorrow, my uh, my intellectual uh, uh, um, efforts live on. Yeah. Because somebody else takes them away from me and does something else with it. Mm -hmm. I was just, it was very interesting, I just saw this talk about the uh, the death of Flash gaming and uh, uh, it was it was very insightful for me as an open source web guy that like the Flash community from the very beginning was all about like sharing and, and working with each other and doing creative mm -hmm. things together but it was always defined as making money as well. Yeah. And that's not a bad thing, that's actually a very sensible thing to think about. Far too many things we do on the web are free because something horrible happens to our users with ads and being tracked and all these kind of things there. Mm -hmm. So that it that it's a dirty thing to think you should make money with what you're doing is a very big failure of our market right now. We we, mm -hmm. we, we believed in the nine in the two thousand with the first dot com boom that free money comes from everywhere as soon as you write software. <laughs> <laughs> this, this is not the case. It's like we, we, we have to understand that we're burning somebody else's money and uh, we're not bringing it back to the community. Mm -hmm. there's, a, a, there's a few great books on that one right now, how we actually we, we made a whole new uh, factory work environment, which is the highly paid developers that we are. Mm -hmm. We should be happy, but we're not because we're not appreciated for what we do. We just appreciated for what we release and other people do it. Like 90% mm -hmm. of the money in IT companies goes to the CEO and the rest gets distributed more or less evenly. Yeah. And mm -hmm. this is not right either. This is like, this is not the, the way this should work. Uh, well, uh, it's not really the, just the CEO, right? Because the CEO is also, also getting paid uh, some amount of money, but he also owns the company and controls that wealth. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it depends on the uh, on the right person. But in uh, in terms of like in VC funded companies, that's a given that the money should go only to the upper management and the, mm. the developers are basically uh, uh, you can re you can uh, remove them nilly willy every month and nothing would change. Mm. We always try to say like, oh, at conferences we give these talks about like how to make sure your code lives for the next fifty years. Nobody wants this any longer. Nobody mm. cares about that anymore. It's just like who's the first to market is the one that wins. Mm. And that's a very, very dangerous and unmaintainable way we're working right now. Mm -hmm. This is, um, And that's how security holes happen. That's now unmaintainable systems. That's how people put their efforts and creating a nice profile and maintaining it and uploading lots of pictures and tagging them. And then the company goes bust and all their stuff gets away and like, well, it was free. What did you think? You have the right to keep your stuff? Yeah, there was a, I don't remember where this quote came from, but someone said that it's kind of sad that uh, the smartest people in our generation are just working on making people click on certain links. 
right? Because everything that we do as web developers, or most of it, comes down to making the, uh, the user click on an advert. I think that's also ad that's also outdated. I mean, the really scary thing is the people that do the social algorithm and also deep learning algorithms on people's data that keep people using the system no matter what. Yeah. Mm. Like we keep we, we 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 only live on numbers. Like how many updates were in that thing? How many interactions did you do? There's kids that actually uh, in uh, in Snapchat they have to keep a cadence up. They have to do like 50 snaps a day or something to get another badge. And when they go on holiday, they give their Snapchat login to friends of theirs so they keep their Snapchat alive while they're gone. Oh good. <laughs> this is like a Tamagotchi but uh, with ads. Yeah. <laughs> this is terrible. This is like we become a slave to the update and we become uh, and that's why why depression is on the rise and these things as well because people make up a, a a social persona an online persona that doesn't exist but then they actually get depressed because their real life is not as as great as the life that they made up of themselves online mm -hmm. yeah i gave a ted talk about this uh, two years ago in, in, in linz uh, about like how make social media social again and it's a, it's this rat race that you have to get out of mm -hmm. like People make themselves look much better online than they are and then they get depressed because they're not that person that they uh, just invented. And, and, and they did get depressed because they think that the other people are the pe people they show themselves to. But, okay, yeah, because everybody's reality, just faking to each other. Yeah, yeah and, and, and when, you, when you try to live up to the standard that was set by someone faking something better than they actually have, that's, that's kind of difficult, right? Yeah, but the whole system is rigged that way because it's all about constant updates and constant new yeah. features. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of sad. And the, the, the great thing, I, mean, they, I saw the keynote, I saw them rehearsing the keynote yesterday. They're gonna, there's going to be percussion using computers now. So really? they're going to play on like monitors and keyboards and stuff. So this is going to be good now. Yeah, I'm, I'm gonna looking forward to that. Okay, well, thank you for being here. I really enjoyed the discussion. You're welcome. <laughs> okay, goodbye. See you soon. See you. Thank you for watching this episode. I hope it earned your subscription. But while you're here, let me show you something. The people behind me are playing a game called Lean Poker. It's a fun and exciting way to learn how you can deliver value much faster than you have ever imagined. It's exciting. The link is in the description. Check it out if you want to support this channel.